Craig Murray is a journalist, an author, a diplomat, former British ambassador to Uzbekistan, a whistleblower, and a friend for a long time with Julian Assange. And we welcome him to see him live. Craig, thanks for coming on uh, with Thank such you short notice. So you're in Strasbourg, where I wish I was actually, but uh, with such short notice, and I'd just flown back from Europe to the U.S. Tell me about the time you spent with Julian over the last couple of days. Yeah, it's been um, a very heartwarming couple of days. Uh, obviously, great to see Julian again, to, to hear him be able to speak in public, particularly after having been through so many weeks and days of his trial where he was kept at the back in a sealed box and not allowed to open his mouth at any stage. To, so to hear him able to actually take a public platform and speak again was really great. And it's been quite triumphant in a sense. So he, you know, he, he was very warmly received at the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Um, and it, it, it's really been... Uh, a standout success uh, as his first sort of appearance in, in public. Were you expecting him to give a media interview first? Were you surprised that this was his first appearance? Yes, I should say I'd had a mention of it as a possibility a few weeks ago, but I didn't know it was actually happening until... Um, by three, day, three days before it happened, when probably like like most people, I found out, out about it on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, it was seven <laughs> days, only seven days in advance. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Exactly a week um, so, uh, and I, I think it was quite a, a late decision. But the the Council of Europe has been um, very supportive of of Julian, much more so than any other major international institution, and. I think for that reason, he felt it was a very good platform and there was a, there was a very good motion to be debated by the Parliamentary Assembly. Um, so, so I think those were factors that made him think this was good. And, and it's a very simple way to, to gather the world's media together you know, in a place which has all the facilities for that to, to, to be done. Yeah. Um, so... Yes, it, it was, and I think it was better in a sense to um, to to do it this way, to make a prepared statement in public, then take questions from members of the parliamentary assembly, as opposed to a media appearance, uh, which, which would be much more of a scrum. Yeah, that's what I thought it was going to be. I thought he was going to be questioned by members of the assembly in a typical hearing in a uh, parliamentary setting. You know, there'd been speculation that he would do a, a big TV interview. And in fact, when we uh, left London hours after we knew he was released and flew to Canberra, hoping we would be able to see him or go to a press conference, they, we, we learned that guess who was in Canberra giving a speech at the ho one of the big hotels there? Tucker Carlson. So there was speculation there that, and I think it's pretty clear because actually I had it confirmed that he was there trying to negotiate an interview with Julian Assange. And I find it very uh, impressive that he didn't go for that, that kind of attention at all, and that he chose this very serious forum after a very serious report and a resolution about his case to deliver his first remarks. I think that's absolutely right. Um, it did mean, of course, that he had to then fall in with the timing of the Council of Europe and when the Parliamentary Assembly was was hearing this resolution. So the timing wasn't dictated by him. He had to fall into a timeline. And I I think ideally um, he wouldn't have done something as early as as this because um, he, he gave a very impressive speech, but plainly he's not recovered back to the normal old Julian. Uh, you know, that, that was very obvious. And... Um, I was worried about him uh, and worried about him, you know, getting through it and coping with the stress of it. Uh, and I, and I, I think this may be the last thing he does for a while. I, I think he will go back into recovery now. And did you sense, and not to get too, to pry too much into your personal uh, meetings, when your private meetings with him, but did you get that sense also when you met with him that he wasn't fully back yet? 
Um, I didn't really have a private meeting with him. I, I only interacted with him in in public, if you like, in with, with a lot of other people around. I, I, I didn't um, sure. have a, have a private one on one on one meeting, um, but that was my. But I mean that that was strongly my, very strongly my, but my sense that he's not fully back yet. Um, right. And, and but his entire behavior, his, his comportment, the way he answered questions, the speed of his thinking, if if you like, was just nowhere near the normal mm. Julian. That's not to say he wasn't very effective uh, and didn't do extremely well, and the prepared speech w w was excellent. But he, he very plain. And um, I should say Stella said afterwards, she actually, um, I would perhaps not say anything were it not for the fact that Stella gave a, a, a press conference or answered questions from journalists immediately after his appearance before the committee of the parliamentary assembly. And she said in that, that while not, um, while not invading Julian's privacy, uh, she felt she could say that his recovery was, was very far from complete. Hmm. Um, uh, and that, that was my strong, that, that was definitely my strong sense. That, 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 that was my strong sense too. Um, and so I, I hope there will now be a further period of, of, of rest and recovery because it's only a few weeks, uh, since he was, uh, since he was released. It was only, um, in, in June, I think, uh, so um, and it, it, it was, uh, and this is October. Uh, you know, I. My own hope is that now he will return to being isolated, uh, with his family, continuing to get to know his family, and resting up and and getting used to the world again. Um, uh, until after Christmas, you know, but but that's what I I hope would happen now, and that's the advice I've actually given Star. Yes, so he he did mingle with the public after. Uh after his remarks, uh, people in the room there. So we're, we're also now joined by Richard Medhurst. Thank you, Richard, for coming on. Um, we uh, we were just chatting with uh, Craig here about uh, Julian's condition and how he appeared to Craig in terms of he and Craig is saying he didn't feel he came fully back. We haven't gotten into the substance yet of the remarks. Let me go to Elizabeth if she has any early question before we start giving getting into the substance of Julian's remarks and also the parliamentary debate that we heard this morning. Sure. I just wanted to get your feelings, Craig, just initial ones about the gravity of the of Pace and their uh, resolution being so supportive of Julian and also the the real history of what happened to him, the impact of the releases. It's so the opposite of everything the corporate media has spouted for years. Um, and for a lot of us who followed this case, you know, it's a lot of information we already knew. But what do you think the impact is of, of um, such an accurate kind of retelling of history that we don't hear very often? Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, the um, absolutely excellent uh, report by the by the uh, Icelandic rapporteur who, who drew up the, the report uh, with a huge amount of detail about what really happened in this case, um, and the, the declaration, uh, the firm declaration that Julian was a political prisoner, um, and acknowledgement of all the abuses of judicial process, um, plus, of course, the uh, strong acknowledgement of United States war crimes, uh, torture, abduction, rendition, uh, killings, um, the... Um, it really was a, a very, very firm statement. And what was very notable was that it had the very, very strong support of members of this parliamentary committee. And the committee was from all over Europe, um, and not only from all over Europe, but from people of all kinds of political parties, members of parliament in their... All the members of this committee are members of parliament in their home country, and they're on parties ranging from the right to the left. And, and they were the committee members, even members represented, for example, the European People's Party, which is the, the kind of main right wing, centre right party in, in Europe. Um, the members of the committee who studied 
the case, um, came round to supporting Julian because they learned the facts of the case that they weren't aware of before. And they came round to supporting Julian irrespective of their political ideology. Uh, and that to me was absolutely fascinating. Uh, and and, um, and it does, of course, draw a line. And I, I had a chance to, I, 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 I talked with many members of the committee over the last few few days, um, again, from, from all kinds of political parties. And it was said to me again and again and again, but until they started working on the committee, they didn't understand the case at all because they were, like so many other people, they were the victims of the complete misinformation about the case put out by the, by, by the media. Um, so it... it it, it was very welcome and, and, and very interesting and very different, for example, um, from a situation in the European Parliament where there's never been a proper committee or investigation where, where they've really seriously looked at the, uh, the issues and attempts to get a, a motion before the European Parliament ha have been unsuccessful. In addition to what you said earlier about Assange's uh, state of health and kind of being a little bit slower, perhaps, I also thought, though, kind of on the opposite angle, I felt that it was really interesting that he commented so much about current affairs and what's been going on that he's experienced since his release from prison, you know, from Gaza and Ukraine to artificial intelligence. I thought that was really interesting. Um, and it, it you know, if we, especially if we don't hear from him for a long time, um, I was gladdened to know that he's still interested in the world, in politics and in engaging in that, um, you know, as he recovers. Just your thoughts on that. I think that's true. I'm. I'm to be perfectly honest. He spoke on that less than I would have wished. The uh, I gave advice on his presentations, not not unsolicited. I would, I would say uh, I gave advice on his presentation, and my advice was very much go with the future, go with being relevant today. Don't dwell. You know, refer to obviously all the contents of the report, all the terrible things that have been done to you. Um, uh, but make the main thrust, what we need to do now and what policy recommendations need to come in place to stop it happening to anyone else. And then the other things that are happening in the world today, and particularly all the new threats to freedom of speech that are coming on. And he did he did refer to that. Uh, and he he spoke to that. And I mean, one interesting thing was he said that in many, but you know, so many things have changed and very often changed for the worse since he's been in, uh, in jail. But he really needs, he, he's been concentrating on his recovery and he really needs to have time to study these things in, in more detail, in depth, before he, he really comes forward with what he thinks on, for example, artificial intelligence, where he made some, some very intelligent initial comments, but said he needs more time to study the subject in depth. Uh, but it was a very good indication of the kind of work I think he will be doing in the future. Uh, so, uh, uh, and and that, was, that was good to see. I had one last question before we move on, and that was just, what uh, impact do you think this might have uh, in terms of the U.S.? Do you expect any response from the U.S.? I mean, personally, I wouldn't. I think they'll just ignore it. But what do you think about that? I think exactly that. I think the U.S. will just pretend this didn't happen. To explain to people, the Council of Europe is sort of the grandfather of European institutions. It's not the European Union. It's not the Organization for Security and Cooperation in, in Europe, both of which are, in a sense, um, uh, more, more active in the you know the European Union obviously is a a massive, uh, <laughs> massive actor in the world economy with, with budgets of billions and billions of euros, and the OSCE is, is well known for deploying staff and monitors in trouble spots all around the world, including deploying military observers and that kind of thing. Whereas the Council of Europe, it's the institution. He dates those institutions. So it, it, as I say, it's the grandfather okay. of European institutions. It's tasked with overseeing democracy and human rights in the European space. And the European Court of Human Rights, for example, is a Council of Europe body. The, 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 the European Court of Human Rights depends from the, the, the Council of Europe. And what this body was is the parliamentary assembly of the Council of Europe, where um, national parliaments send uh, delegates to, to a joint assembly of national parliaments, which is different to the directly elected European Parliament of the European Union, and bluntly has less power. 
And the European Parliament of the European Union makes laws, which are, they have to be confirmed by the Commission and Council, but the, but the European Un Parliament of the European Union makes <laughs> hard law, which is as binding as any law, but possibly more binding than most laws. Um, this, this body can't make law. Uh, it, it makes declarations, it makes recommendations, it's made strong recommendations for what the European Union and what national governments should do to redress the wrongs and prevent this kind of thing happening again. But it has no enforcement mechanism. Um, so uh, it, it can be ignored and it it will be ignored, I think, by, by the... It, it, it's, it's a political declaration of the the views of European Parliament. Uh, and it was a very, very strong declaration in Julian's favour, which is very important. But uh, but the, the US will simply ignore it, and the UK government will simply ignore it. The UK government, uh, nobody representing the UK government spoke at any stage during the entire process. Uh, and I think that, that, that tells you the way they are playing this. They're, they're just pretending it doesn't. It's not happening. Well, that's interesting, uh, Craig, because... It's, Britain is still part of the European Council. It has nothing to do, as you say, with the EU and Brexit. And it began in 1949. But there was, wasn't there a parliamentarian who asked a question about what's the evidence for your torture? It seemed quite, he said at the beginning, there's obviously in this room, you've got a lot of support, but I want to know what's the proof of pressure of, of the torture that you say you went through in prison. Uh, wasn't he a member of the British Parliament? Yeah, he, he doesn't represent the British government. He's an opposition member of the British opposition. Parliament. Um, he's a conservative, uh, uh, Edward Edward Lee, someone very much of the the right wing of the Conservative Party. Nobody from the ruling party, nobody from the British Labour Party, um, spoke at all at any stage. Right. So, Richard, let me bring you in here. Uh, Craig uh, and Elizabeth were talking about how how knowledgeable Julian was of current situation. This guy spent five years in a maximum security prison, and you you can't find anyone walking around who's been walking around the street freely over the last five years in a Western country that probably is as well-informed as he is. I mean, how did he get this information? Uh, they must have brought him a lot of good articles uh, printed out. What was your impression overall of his uh, speech yesterday to the to this parliamentary assembly? Yeah, I mean, first of all, thanks for having me on, Joy. And um, it, it was great. It was great. I watched it live, and and uh, it was good to see him and and hear him speak. Um, I I mean, pe people have been kind of saying, well, he's he's not a hundred percent yet where he used to be, or he is. I, I I was just happy to hear him speak, and I and I, I found him to be very uh, lucid and 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 you know present. And it, it's normal to, of course talk about this because they did they did in fact torture him they they did um isolate him and um i'm glad that it didn't you know wear him down and as 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 you suggested he he does seem to be uh you know up to date on current affairs and i was very happy that he brought up things like you know what's happening in in ukraine what's happening in gaza that he uh extended or expanded the purview of of this uh, persecution of journalists from from his case to a global epidemic of of uh, repression, and it's it's very important to 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 bring this up because one one of the ways that you know they they are targeting people um, is is through tech. I mean, they you know they we saw what happened to Al Jazeera journalists, for example, the precision that is being used, and and you know uh, he he of course hinted at Lavender, which is that artificial intelligence program that the Israelis are using. So, you know, the, it, it is very important because WikiLeaks originally started out as, as you know, and he, he mentions his background as having, uh, you know, studied um, uh, cryptography and all these things of meshing, if you will, journalism with tech. So I, I was very happy to see him uh, up to date on those things. And I'm sure that, as, as he said, he'll have more information or, or more detailed answers on that in the future. But, you know, overall, it, it was, uh, I know you guys were just, if I could just pivot very slightly, you were talking about, um, uh, I think it was Edward Lee, uh, the, the one who said there was, you know, what's the evidence to torture? <laughs> I mean, I, fa I found that quite insulting, to be honest. He can go and lock himself up 23 hours in a cell and see how much he likes it uh, for one day, never mind for a couple of years. And then he'll come, you know, he can come back and tell us what, what he thinks. But, um, you know, I, I, I found that quite insulting, to be honest. And 
um, in, in any case, uh, I'm, I'm glad that they were able to cover so many topics, you know, and, and Julian said at the very beginning of the presentation that the point is not just to uh, talk about himself, but also to guide the attention of the committee towards what's happening worldwide. So, you know, it, it, it was good to hear him speak. Um, um, and I'm happy that uh, they they passed it in, in, in favor of him today at the uh, at the vote. Uh, I know there was like some 20 abstentions or something, but the over overwhelming majority, they, they were in favor. And that was good to see. Um, either way, you know, the, the point is he's out of he's out of prison. He he won. And I think that statement, you know, those words he said where he had to plead guilty to journalism, that was really the most powerful moment in the entire presentation. And I, and I think many will agree with me because it really is what happened. You know, he didn't commit a crime. He, he just solicited and published classified information, which is what everyone does. Uh, which is which is normal, which is perfectly legal and fine, and and he had to go uh, uh, effectively and and plead guilty to that. And when he said the system didn't work, that that was another very uh, powerful uh, moment. Um, you know, it, it's true, it it didn't work. It still doesn't work, and it's getting uh, worse and worse, unfortunately. You know, while he was his his process, the extradition process was going on. Those of us covering were very immersed in the details of it. We accepted it as a given that this was happening. But now that it's all over and he's she's out, I mean, the whole thing was a nightmare that happened. I, I can hardly believe that it really happened, that he spent all that time in a maximum security prison and that the British courts actually took seriously this whole thing. And it was only at the last minute because... Vanessa Baretsev, the lower court judge, never asked the Home Office to provide assurances on the death penalty and the uh, freedom of expression. It was only at the very end that this was finally brought up because she said it would happen. The U.S. courts would decide that this. this thing is unbelievable what yeah. went on. So, yeah, I, I wanted to ask you now to get into the substance. He said uh, two things interesting. One, I won this appeal. He saw, of course, it never went. Uh, it, it never happened because he was he made the deal because they knew they were going to lose. I've been going around yeah. making speeches now saying, you know, we shouldn't pat ourselves on the back too much. Those of us in alternative media or even human rights groups and press freedom groups and the president of Mexico and Brazil, et cetera, all that pressure was very useful, softened up the U.S. government. But I think they were so resistant to this pressure. They, they're so arrogant and so determined to crush this man that it was only when they understood that they were going to lose this case because the British judges could not go for The British lawyers, so I was talking about James Lewis and Claire Dobbin, informed the U.S., the Department of Justice, they couldn't continue with the case anymore without this assurance. And that email, that famous email now that the Washington Post published back from a U.S. lawyer in London back to the DOJ, we are going to lose the case. That's why it was out. So I want to ask you... Um, Rich, about a statement he made about British judges. And then I want to ask yeah. Craig. He said that, you know, they are aligned with U.S. interests. He was quite forward in his criticism there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was very potent. And uh, uh, I, I I noticed that as well. He said that even when they decided in his favor, <laughs> they were still, you know, doing, um, um, you know, they, they were still basically, you know, serving U.S. interests in the end, and and I know there's there's been lots of uh, background research done on, uh, you know, what is it, Henry Jackson Society, and all, and all these various ties they have. You know, they 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 they're all connected in one way or another, financially, politically, to the United States. And and I know that that sounds like a given, and it's like a very obvious thing to say. Okay, the U.K. and U.S. are allies. Yes, we know that, but it's really much more entrenched than that. It's really much more concerning because, um, you know. Th th this is someone's life. You know, you're you're suffering in a jail cell the whole time. Um, it, it, it's not a game, you know. It, and and I mean, I I felt the whole time. Every time we were going inside the court, I I felt like this is not an independent, serious body. And and it hurt me, you know, to think that. I I, I didn't I don't say this like, you know, uh, happily. On the contrary, it's quite it's quite sad. Um, but I didn't feel like it's an independent judiciary. I didn't feel like it's being uh, taken seriously by the judges. And I'm not saying like they're all, you know, they, they wake up in the morning and they clasp their hands and think how they can serve the U.S. and do evil. No, but generally speaking, you know, that, that's where we're at. And, and the whole treaty itself, from the beginning, people were warning that this is very one uh, uh, one sided. And, and, and I believe they raised the point that you have Julian raised the point that you have nine times more people being extradited from the UK to the US than the other way around. Like, I mean, that, that's true, by the way, of mo most of the planet. You've, you've got 
so many people being dragged off from Latin America, for, dragged off from around the world to the US and the Americans, they never extradite their own people. Why don't we take care of our own that way? I mean, I know Julian doesn't have British citizenship, but but still, you know, he was in our country. Um, and, and you know, we shouldn't allow the Americans to impose their laws uh, on, on our side of the, the, the Atlantic. And and especially this this ridiculous premise that, you know, you can be prosecuted under U.S. law, but you can't be protected under U.S. law. I mean, that's just inherently unfair. Right. That's just inherently unfair. And that's how they, the lawyers going back to your, your point. That's how the lawyers back themselves into a corner, because in the end, it was about nationality. It was about. Um, you know, they, they knew that they can't uh, uh, give these assurances about uh, him receiving First Amendment protections. And it, it, it was ultimately, I mean, it, it's kind of scary because what's the point of, of winning in the end if you still suffer for years and years and years in prison? That's that's not justice to me. That's not fair. No, absolutely not. And this is exactly Julian's words. Quote, the United Kingdom's establishment is made up of people who have benefited from that system for a long period of time, and almost all judges are from it. They don't need to be told explicitly what to do. They understand what is good for that cohort, and what is good for that cohort is keeping a good relationship with the United States. An extraordinary attack on a politicized judicial system. Craig, what did you? Uh, how did you react to that statement from Julian? No, that's that's right. I was very pleased by it because it it you know very much squares with my own. My own analysis that I've been publishing for, for for years and explaining that the judges there's not a system where someone in the home office rings up the judge and says this is what the decision want you to get. It's more that you know within their social group they know what is expected, and the um, and that was preceded by Julian spelling out and even naming in the individual companies saying you know British Aerospace Shell BP he he he, he was pointing out the, the important economic links between the United Kingdom and the United States economies uh, and economic links of the kind of companies, arms companies, oil companies, that these cohorts are invested in. But, but this is not this is not a academic concept. This is about, you know, real cash and, uh, and real econo hard economic interests of this class of people. Um, and so I... I, I I thought that was really very strong, uh, and um, and in many ways perhaps the the most left wing part of his analysis in his uh, is, you know, in, in in the talk he gave because um, much of the time my feeling was um, that this was a slightly less controversial Julian than we're used to in that I think he was he was very aware of the need to win the plenary vote the next day and and not to alienate um, uh, more political groups and he had to if you if you like so in some cases he was actually quite careful to balance for example every time he mentioned gaza he also mentioned ukraine yeah. um and he didn't he didn't say which side he was on on ukraine particularly he, he just mentioned ukraine and, and so in mentioning the killing of journalists in gaza he immediately mentioned the killing of journalists in ukraine for uh, for example and that was uh, uh that, that bluntly is a, a, a mollify the right move uh in terms of winning the debate the next day. So so it was, uh, and in a way, this is a sign that his brain is working, <laughs> that he was, he was thinking tactically and politically. Um, and he wasn't, he, he wasn't coming over as, as radical, as, but that point about the British ruling class, the established, he used establishment rather than ruling class, I think, and their economic ties and, and big oil and the arms industry and things. That was kind of as left wing as he got, but he he he, but he was a slightly toned down Julian. I don't think that's because of illness. I, I think that was that was tactical, uh, and it was interesting to me. Exactly, he just left it out there that journalists are being killed. There, he didn't say which side. I mean, the assumption is the Russians are killing all of well, I mean, Ukraine has killed a few journalists, certainly imprisoned them and shut down newspapers and all. So he left that open. Back to the courts, though. Why, in your view, Craig, and we may have discussed this before, but I think it's a good time to bring it up again. Why did finally this these two new high court judges decide that they were going to make an issue of the assurances, particularly the First Amendment one, that ultimately led to his release? Why? What do you think changed? Were they no longer, did they get a backbone? Why did they stand up to the U.S. extradition request at that moment, finally. I think it really was individual. I, I, I actually think it's as simple as, as Dame Victoria Sharp being uh, an individual 
with a degree of, of intellectual self-respect. She was the first judge who had ever been appointed at any stage of a case whose professional background is in media law. She's an expert in media law. That is her, where she comes from. So the all the dangers to journalism that everyone's been talking about, uh, and which had meant nothing whatsoever to any of the other judges, uh, uh, who were mostly focused on national security, um, uh, meant something to her. <laughs> it meant something to her professionally. And she simply... the. The arrogant failure of the United States to even pretend to give the assurance they'd been asked for, if you see what I mean. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't even make a good job of trying to fudge something that sounded like an assurance but wasn't really an assurance or whatever. They, they, they basically just refused to give the assurance she demanded. And I think um, uh, I think they just came across somebody you can't push around like that. And they, uh, we all know, and, and I do think it... It was a matter of the individual judge. I must think that, and she was sort of the senior of the two judges um, at that last stage of the hearing. And it was only really the last, right at the end, that she became involved. And also, you know, you have this situation where when you get judges of that seniority, um, uh, they're unlikely to be promoted, or they probably have no desire to be promoted. Uh, they can't be sacked. Literally, they cannot be be, be sacked. And um, and I presume the CIA failed to find um, any, any blackmail material on her. She must be a very clean living person, <laughs> because otherwise, pressure of some kind would have been have been brought. But uh, as a a distinguished um, independent. Uh, legal brain who has gone as far as her career can go, who has reached the top of her profession, cannot be sacked and is financially independent and secure. Um, they just didn't find a way to pressurise her. And I, I honestly believe that that's what it is. I, I think it just happened to come across um, so, somebody not corrupt in the system. And I've actually been giving this explanation to several journalists who asked me what had happened over the last few days here, and they all scoff, and none of them believe me and say that's impossible. You, you know, you, there aren't good people in the system near the top of the system. But remember, I was a British ambassador, uh, uh, and uh, that know, happened. Yeah. It, <laughs> it is possible for principled people to rise in the system. You know, for for the odd maverick to exist within the system is possible, and I think they just came again. They came up against. An honest judge, having been through about 12 dishonest judges on the way, they finally hit an honest judge, uh, and that's what stopped them. I, I believe it's as simple as that. That's very interesting. Uh, uh, Julian did say, and we, what was really interesting is to get insights, his own insights into what happened in his case. We've been writing and speaking about this for four years, trying to figure out what uh, he might be thinking, and now we finally got a chance. And he did say, quote, when all the judges, whether they were finding in my favor or not in the United Kingdom, showed extraordinary deference to the United States, engaged in astonishing intellectual backflips to allow the U.S. to have its way on my extradition and in relation to setting precedents that occurred in my case more broadly, that, that that's my, to my mind, is a function of... So he, he had these very sharp barbs, but as you say... Uh, he finally, uh, Craig, he finally got lucky. Richie, talking about uh, the media now, I think he made a veiled, and I want to get Craig's views on this too, I think he made a veiled criticism of The Guardian. Because he said at one point, it took him a while living in the United Kingdom to figure out how that society worked. Uh, who to trust, who not to trust, how manipulative it can be, et cetera. And then when he was asked what mistakes he made, basically, I, the only one he really fessed up to was we could have chosen better media partners. I couldn't only have been The Guardian. Yeah, I've, <laughs> I found that quite funny because I think it was one of the longest pauses that he made during the whole uh, presentation where he was trying not to offend people in the UK. And 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 again, as Craig was was talking about, be come across as more measured and, and tempered. Um, which, which he did, of course, successfully. Uh, but, um, you know, he, he was being very diplomatic about it. And I do think you're, you're correct, Joey, that he was referring to The Guardian. Um, you know, uh, I, it's ironic that the, the one who was asking him about uh, torture, I think, had the same surname as uh, David ah, Lee, right? So, exactly. the, the, yeah, I'm not saying they're related or something, but it was just, it was just a funny right. coincidence. Um, 
And uh, yeah, we, we, we of course know about the password being published and so on. And I think it, it's not just the password, it's also the um, that big betrayal that happened on September 1st, uh, 2010, when they wrote this collective letter, uh, I think Guardian along with you know, other media partners uh, uh, across the West, uh, Die Presse, Le Monde, and New York Times, and so on. And they kind of say, well, you know, you, you're irresponsible. We, we, you know, we know the details. It's, it's not true or accurate, but they they still had, you know, this this letter put out. And uh, very, very bizarre. Um, w one thing, I, I don't know if he was referring to that in particular, or maybe a, a more broader criticism, which um, all of us have made that, you know, in the years you spent... Uh, in in confinement, they could have done more to uh, advocate for his release. They they could have done, you know, a, a, a campaign, uh, a full spread, you know, every day, something. Um, I know we had op-eds once in a while, especially in the run up to his release, it became more and more, uh, uh, you know, politically acceptable um, in mainstream media to to advocate for his release. And And he said, as a matter of fact, in his presentation yesterday that, so one of the last groups to finally come around and and uh, advocate for his uh, release were were the journalists, um, you know, and, and and that's quite shocking, right? Because we're all in the same boat on this one, uh, or you would you would think so. Um, so, you know, that that was that was that was quite um, quite damning. I I I think he was referring more generally, not just about British media, but but nevertheless, it, it certainly does apply. Uh, but it's really poignant that he focus specifically on the UK when when making that uh, criticism and he is correct it is a particular society and you have to to um maneuver a lot i believe that was the the verb that he he used which you know i i think shouldn't be the case um and i i think we should have more solidarity with each other as as he said and and i'm seeing that more now um uh you know generally speaking uh, i hope that you know, his case at least maybe woke some people up, although it shouldn't have come to that. But, uh, you know, in the end, the, the problem is that he was, you know, convicted of something that he shouldn't have been convicted of. And, and, I, and, I, and I believe the UK will also look at it that way. Um, and, uh, you, you know, it's, it's just really, it's really awful that this happened uh, uh, in England, uh, especially because you, you would expect better protections of journalists and you would expect a, a better code of ethics uh, from from the media establishment, you know, standing up for a colleague and so on. Um, I, I honestly, I, I'm I'm still in shock, and, and and I don't I don't think that's something any of us will will really get over easily. Uh, I I don't feel that uh, the UK really is is a safe place for for, for journalists, and um, but I, I don't think that it was. Yeah. Who's speaking? <laughs> I I know this sounds really biased coming from me, but. I did say this before I was ever arrested. So to be fair, <laughs> maybe that was um, one of the reasons you shouldn't be saying things like that. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I, I still don't know. Maybe, maybe it is, but uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, just to fill in the, our audience, uh, what he referred to about the publishing the password is David Lee was one of the journalists who worked closely with Julian and they had some kind of close relationship for a while. He, uh, and Luke Harding wrote a book in which they use as a chapter title the actual password to decrypt the encrypted uh, diplomatic files, which had uh, not been uh, uh, not been redacted. These were the unredacted files. And Julian, of course, was blamed mercilessly by the United States in his extradition process, in the media, everywhere else, for having put all these people at danger because he really, and it was actually these two Guardian journalists who inadvertently perhaps did it. So I think that, yeah, that was one of his uh, reasons for attacking the Guardian. Uh, Craig, what are your thoughts on, on Julian and the Guardian and what he said? I think it plainly was a, a dig at the Guardian, and I'm quite sure he would have liked to say a lot more, but I <laughs> thought it wasn't the, the occasion to do it. And I, I look forward to him saying more on that subject in the in the future, which would be good. Uh, one thing I want to mention, um, the last time I was in that building of the Council of Europe, uh, at a, a committee of the Council of Europe was 20 years ago uh, when I was myself a witness before, I think the same committee or, or similar committee, um, giving evidence on torture and extraordinary rendition and giving my evidence um, of, you know, my, my direct first-hand evidence that I had been, you know, at meetings where it was openly 
stated and told to me that ministers had decided that in the war against terror, we were to get intelligence from torture. And I, I gave my testimony to a hall that was as packed as the one we saw for Julian, you know, with a couple of hundred people, 50 or 60 journalists. Um, uh, and there, as a member of the committee, was Edward Lee. And he um, he stood up and actually called me a traitor. <laughs> told me as a member of the committee wow. and and he suggested that, that the um that the council of europe should have a policy that traitors were not allowed to testify before committees uh so uh, to see uh, that old fool still there still still doing his <laughs> stuff 20 years later was, was a very very unpleasant kind of deja vu <laughs> um, so uh but the other interesting thing was, though, that at the end of Julian's speech, everybody in that committee room, the entire committee room, got up and gave him a standing ovation, which I should say they didn't do to me 20 years ago. And they, um, and it's very Except Edward Lee, I would imagine. Except Edward Lee. Yes, well, there were probably, out of the 200 people in that room, or 220 people in that room, there, there were about 12 people who didn't stand. Um and uh, I think almost certainly Edward Lee would be one of them. But you've got to remember that that, that audience was consisted of members of a parliamentary assembly, mostly from all over Europe and of all different political parties, uh, you know, including quite wing, right wing political parties. With very few exceptions, they joined in the standing ovation. But even more, the entire media joined in the standing ovation, in wow. including, you know, every journalist. But there wasn't anybody. In the, in the media, the three rows for media at the back, there wasn't one person who didn't join in that standing ovation. And they weren't alternative media. They were mainstream media from all over Europe. And, I mean, of course, uh, I was thinking it would have been wonderful to have this unanimous support <laughs> 10 years ago. Uh, this is a bit late, lads. But at least it was there now. And, and you did get the impression that the you know members of the media... And, and these, were, these were not... They weren't there because they support Julian Sands. These were just people doing their jobs. These these are, you know, hard-bitten, cynical reporter types who, who'd been sent along. But there they were, joining in a standing ovation. I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen the media join in a standing ovation at a party conference, for example, or something like that. You know, this really was a remarkable thing. Uh, and it's one of the... Um, one of the reasons I think this, this does have an impact. It really does have an impact on, on how people think. And one thing I wanted to add also, uh, going back a little bit to the conversation about the media, The Guardian, um, and UK journalism, I'll never forget in 2017, um, after obviously the the furor in the media in response to the, the 2016 publications that uh, the DNC in the US did not like one bit, that uh, the media hosted a lot of, you know, military intelligence type people and whatnot, who said the most unbelievably caustic vitriolic um stuff about it wanting assange to be tortured that he was a traitor and a, all of this stuff that was incredibly violent and i'll never forget assange um because he was on twitter at the time compiling this list of all of these statements that were either made by media person uh, personalities themselves or people they hosted who were part of the deep state essentially um and so yeah to see him make at least a veiled comment about uk journalism was interesting but it, it kind of reminded me of of how he had really gone through and just talked about the um, the insane statements that were made about him in, in 2016, 2017. Um, but moving on, I wanted to ask you all about your um, your thoughts about one statement Assange made that I really, really liked. And it was basically saying that journalism should be activism in the pursuit of truth. Um, I thought that was brilliant because a lot of times, you know, people say that we should be completely um, unbiased, but there is, we should be, um, uh, you know, shouldn't be activists, I should say, but we should absolutely be activists for truth, I thought was brilliant. So I just wanted your thoughts on that. I thought it was brilliant. And um, I'm very glad and happy you said that because uh, I think I think in his case, uh, even to this day, you've got some media outlets who, who uh, you know, they they fiddle around with how they refer to him. They say, oh, he's a whistleblower but when he's he's not. Um, or, you know, they, they say activist as well, or hacktivist even, or whatever. He, he's a publisher. He's a journalist, right? You know, uh, I want to chime in here because 
next year is 50 years since I began in professional journalism as a stringer for the New York Times on my university campus, 1975. And it was pretty clear right there that the basic job was to gather evidence from different sides, uh, evaluate that evidence, and get as close to the truth as you can. This idea of being an activist for truth, it was just getting the truth, telling the truth. And I think what we've seen over these 50 years, and particularly recently, is a shutting down uh, through this disinformation industry, that's this anti-disinformation industry, the pressure to no longer listen to what the U.S. considers to be and and Europe and, and Britain, their adversaries, their enemies. We cannot listen to the Russian side. We cannot listen to the Iranian. And if we do, we're stooges. We have to be paid by them. We couldn't possibly be motivated by the truth, by getting to the truth, and that in order to write something means you were paid a position because people are making the allegation of being paid themselves. So uh, I, I find this funny, this whole discussion about being an activist for truth. That's what we're supposed to have been doing all along. Um, I don't know if you had anything to add on that, uh, Craig, but because I wanted to move on to the Pompeii on the CIA once you finished it. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I would move on and say that one thing um, which I, I spoke myself to the United European Left group of MPs um, this morning. Um, and one thing I said to them was that what's very interesting is there's a concerted move across effectively the NATO states um, for legislation to be introduced, which which criminalizes misinformation. Uh, and that's happening in the United States, it's happening in the United Kingdom, it's happening in Italy, it, it's happening in a number of states where the government has either already introduced legislation into the legislature or has announced it's going to, uh, to criminalize misinformation. And you know, a situation where it's the state that determines what is true information, uh, when the state is probably, you know, all the most dangerous lies in history uh, have been told by states or, 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 or forwarded by, by, by states, including, for example, you know, when the United Kingdom and the United States were telling the world that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and deemed it disinformation to say Iraq didn't have weapons of mass destruction when, when Iraq didn't. Uh, and that, that caused... Uh, you know, millions of deaths and and so much of the the ongoing cycle of destruction we've seen throughout the Middle East ever since. So, the um, uh, this is extremely worrying, uh, and and these uh, we need to track closely. And it's not coincidence that this is happening in so many states at the same time. Uh, this is part of a wave of repression that was already underway and has been accelerated by the desire to suppress dissent over Gaza. Uh, that that's the accelerant that, that's pushing this all forward at the moment. And um, and I. Uh, there is actually another motion being put in to the, uh, the plenary of the uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe on this subject. But the, the, the left are taking that up and, and going to try to put a motion forward on that on on on, on that subject and to look to uh, to oppose it in their national uh, legislatures. I also just want to mention when I was standing for election to Parliament in Blackburn. Um, it became a big ele election issue, a dispute of what had happened at a at a meeting a couple of months previously, when I either had or had not been adopted as a candidate by a group, and, and I plainly had been adopted by a candidate. Um, and the local newspaper published an article in which it said that um, I stated that I had been adopted at the meeting as a candidate, and that two other people stated that this had never happened, basically. And I phoned the author of that article, and I said to him, listen, you were at the meeting. You were there. You were physically present. I spoke to you. I, we had a long conversation about it just after I was adopted, and you asked me questions about it, and in fact, you published something on it. And now you're publishing saying that somebody said that what you've already published did not happen. He said, well, I have to show both sides of the story. <laughs> I said, no, you don't. You were there. You saw what happened. What you have to publish is what you saw happen. And, um, and and he just was not accepting that at all. He, As a journalist, he saw his role. Uh, this was a professional journalist working for a mainstream media news group. He saw his role as saying what one side said and the other side said, even though he was there himself and knew what the truth was. And, and I thought that was a really fascinating insight in, into 
I don't know, <laughs> how bad teaching is at journalism school or something. <laughs> Both sides of the story, the truth and the liar side of the story. We have to include the lie. <laughs> I was at that meeting, as you know, Craig, and I filmed and I saw what happened to that it was just unbelievable. Now, amongst uh, we talked about his criticism of the British court, of the judges and of uh, the Guardian, but he really had a, a huge section on Mike Pompeo uh, in which he he went after him. And this was really fascinating for me because to hear him talk about the attempts to kid kidnap him, assassinate him, he really blames the whole thing on Pompeo, which I think was pretty obvious going back. Once he published Vault 7 and really pissed off the CIA, and we heard that inaugural speech of Pompeo as CIA director, in which he devoted a good part of it to WikiLeaks, calling it this now very infamous phrase, a non-state hostile intelligence agency. Um, so I was really impressed by Julian going after him and not taking the gloves off when it came to this guy. He even says, um, uh, he has a really interesting phrase about um, when President Trump had been elected, he appointed two wolves in MAGA hats. Mike Pompeo and William Barr. Greg, were you impressed by that? What was your opinion about Julian going after the CIA in this setting? It was impressive. Um, it was uh, extremely interesting and, and to watch the re reaction of people because it's not normally done. You, you know, you don't hear strong criticism of um, uh, the CIA in, in what is part of the mainstream, an important part of the mainstream political establishment architecture of Europe. It, it, it's unusual. And I also have to put up my hand, and up, I have put my hand and be honest here. Uh, but I said that I'd given advice on, I, they'd asked me you know, for some pointers, and I, I'd given advice saying, do not do this. <laughs> do, not, do not go down the rabbit hole of, of UC Global and the CIA, et cetera, because it's a long and involved rabbit hole. It's a diversion from the main story and the main issues and it, it's complex and weird uh, and will cause dissonance um and i um as throughout my um throughout, throughout my um uh, my period of association with with julian i think he 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 um I'm, I'm sure he always listens to what i say but he 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 more than often than not decides to do something completely different to what i've advised and he he did, he did on this occasion um and it certainly was effective. Uh, I mean, my fear was that it would it would be too controversial and, and would spark a a row and resistance from some of the parliamentarians that may then jeopardise the, the the plenary vote. I, I, I saw it as a diversion. Um, in fact, everyone just you know accepted it, uh, and um, people. It, it, it's interesting that there wasn't any attempt to defend the CIA or say this wasn't true from anyone, uh, not in, not even in the closed sessions of a committee, apparently. You know, that the, the, the um, I think the fact that there are proceedings in a Spanish court, with, which in a prosecution brought by the state, um, gives it a substance and weight that makes it difficult for a body like this to to deny it. Um, so, in, in fact, it was quite... Um, it, it, it 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 was quite effective, and people people accepted it was was true. But it didn't it didn't really play into the main body of the subsequent debate in plenary or the main thrust of the uh, of of the recommendations on protection of journalists and whistleblowers and and and, and, and that kind of thing. So he wanted to get it off his chest. What he had to feel, what he felt about Pompeo, basically. Yeah, plainly he, he felt it. You know, he felt he obviously felt extremely strongly about it, and, and that it was absolutely necessary to say it. And he. As you say, he didn't hold back. He said it in very, very, very strong terms. He also said that uh, you you and your peers shouldn't be surprised about the CIA's meddling in your societies, essentially. Made a remark to that extent. Um, Richard, do you have anything to add on that, Pompeo? Yeah, I I, I understand both positions from, <laughs> from Craig and Julian. Um, you, you know, because on, on the one hand, uh, it, it, it makes sense that you want to stick to the main issue, which is that, you know, whether they spied on me or they didn't spy on me, uh, they they targeted me for my journalism. And that, that you know, that's in contravention to um, democratic principles and freedom of speech. 
at, at the same time, though, I understand Julian's uh, just, you know, frustration and wanting to get that off his chest. And also, I, I think he was trying to get at the point that that, you know, this was um, a politically motivated uh, ordeal and persecution. And it, it was directed from, uh, you know, the highest levels of government and and um, that, uh, you know, they they simply went after him uh, because because of their political positions and ideas being in, in, in direct opposition to his and they didn't like his work. So, I mean, it, it, I understand both positions. Um, I found it f rather ironic when he pointed out that he was reading uh, Pompeo's memoirs while while in prison, <laughs> reading about how Pompeo directed this uh, persecution or ordered it or helped orchestrate it uh, against him. And, you know, it's like he's reading about himself while in the prison. It's, it's, it's quite, must have been quite a surreal uh, experience uh, and, and an upsetting one, to put it mildly. So, uh, you know, Mike Pompeo is just generally speaking, a, a very vicious neoconservative. And I, and I think it's quite it's quite telling, really, that that Donald Trump um, surrounded himself with a lot of neoconservatives. I mean, we, we have Elliot Abrams, uh, we have Nikki Haley, we've, we have uh, Mike Pompeo, uh, Barr, and uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting some some other ones right now. But, um, you, you know, it's it's like no matter who you vote for, you're going to get these people in the end. Exactly. Yeah. And, and uh, what was his name again? Um, mustache guy, Colonel Sanders. Walton, uh, John Walton. <laughs> um, They've infiltrated yeah. every administration since George W. Bush, where they resided in the Republican Party. And then, of course, uh, they wound up in the Obama administration. Hillary Clinton brought in Victoria Nuland, who was her State Department spokeswoman. Right. She rose there and became more and more influential. And then Obama also, uh, not uh, Obama brought, yeah, brought in Nuland. And then, of course, Trump, as we just said, brought in Pompeo. And Biden, who I don't think is in New York, I think he's a traditional warmonger, and there's a slight difference there. Uh, I think he listens to the military. He has a respect, as a creature of Washington for 50 years. He respects what the military has to say about military matters. Unlike Tony Blinken, the chief neocon now that Newland has left, his, he had Newland in his administration. But uh, Blinken is in charge, who tried just recently to get uh, and told uh, Keir Starmer before he went to Washington, told The Guardian, told The New York Times that uh, this had been approved. It's the long range shadow storm shadow missiles into Ukraine, which, of course, Putin said could lead to, would lead to a direct NATO Russia confrontation. All that implies uh, uh, that's so. I think that Biden stood up. The Pentagon stopped that, and Biden sided with the Pentagon. But he, they always infiltrate these administrations, and uh, and these are extremely dangerous people. I, I want to tell a short anecdote that I uh, said on our other webcast. I gave a speech last Saturday in Kingston, New York, to an anti-war rally, and then I, uh, driving back here to Washington, I had to, I passed by the United States Military Academy at West Point, and I decided I'd stop in and do a tour. And it was there that I learned that the cadet's motto is, we will not lie, cheat, or steal. And I said, wait a minute. I think Mike Pompeo went to West Point. And I checked it, and sure enough, he did. He graduated top of his class in 1986. He was wow. taking the piss. He was taking the piss out of his own university. Motto with that statement. We will, in the, now in the CIA. Oh, I think we may have lost Joe for a moment. Joe, can you hear us? That's shocking. Yeah. That wow. <laughs> yeah, that famous. So, w w West Point and the CIA have stopped Joe's um video answers. <laughs> yeah, they were not <laughs> pleased. <laughs> yeah, it, it looks like it. Oh, I, well, I, I'll I'll just I mean that, that I don't know if Joe can hear us, but that that is really quite shocking. It's um it. I don't know what to say, really. I mean, um, I can't imagine someone from uh, Sandhurst in, in the UK doing that. Uh, it would be very, very faux pas. But uh, uh, in in even in the US, honestly, I'm quite surprised that he, he, he'd do that as director of the CIA. I, I'd assume a lot of people would give him um, trouble for it. But uh, I guess uh, I, I guess to Joe's point, they they really do. They really do just trample on everyone and kind of make their ways into, you know, uh, uh, get their hands onto the levers of power. Wow. Wow. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we're back. We froze for a while there. Yeah. Now you're back. Joe. Disappeared. Yeah. OK, so let's see. I'm still recording. Let's see if I'm still recording here. It looks like yes. 
I see. I don't see it, but I did hear. Yeah, there it is. Um, okay. So, um, I don't know where we were. I was just telling that story about Pompeo. So since I have you, you guys here, I cannot, if you could stay a few more minutes to talk about what's going on now in the Middle East, both of you have incredible expertise there. Oh, before I do that, Richie, is there an update since, since what happened to you? Have you, is it giving you greater insight into what Julian went through? As you said previously, you only spent 23 hours in solitary and we know Julian spent five years in this conditions. Uh, is, what did uh, how did that change your perception of Julian's uh, experience? Uh, is there any update on your case? So ne next month, um, next month I'll I'll find out, or perhaps maybe towards the end of the month of this month I'll find out what's going to happen. There's uh, three options: they they can drop the uh, investigation, which would be an NFA no further action. That's one possibility. The, the other one is they can just extend the investigation again, maybe by one month, two months, three months. Um, and they can do that indefinitely, by the way. And the third possibility is they charge me. Um, and, you know, it's 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 not clear what, what, what could happen because I, I think one person from, I think it's Richard Barnard from Palestine Action, he got uh, nicked with the same one as me with 12A, uh, 12-1A. And... I believe that he they closed the investigation, uh, told him no further action, and then I think a week later they reopened it and charged him. So it's it's really like you know, <laughs> you you have to live the rest of your life just you know, uh, kind of in suspense, which I which I find in and of itself bewildering, uh, really, uh, and 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 difficult to grapple with. But um, there, there's there's no further indication uh, right now what what what's going to happen. But it's it's not really. Uh, yeah, it, it's I have to basically live live in limbo right now, and hopefully towards the end of the month it'll be clear what's going on. Um, but uh, in terms of the insight gave me, well, honestly, I mean, I was just uh, you know, I t t I don't know if I said this before, but when when I first came in the station, you know, finally after a while they let me go to the bathroom to the toilet, and uh, just to kind of give you an, an idea of the conditions, when they took me to the toilet, I didn't even grasp that this was a cell. Uh, I thought it was like a cell under construction because I could see other doors in in, in uh, succession and, and it looked like a hallway with cells. But I thought this one was broken or something. It was something wrong with it because of how bad it was. I, I, I didn't even grasp that it was a cell, let alone that it would be my cell. That's how, just to give you an idea. Uh, and I only found out about an hour later or an hour and a half later that, that oh, I'm actually going to be spending the night in here. Um, so that that's, that's just one thing I wanted to say. But in general, I was actually wondering to myself, like, is is this how it is in prison? You know, is it the same thing if you're convicted and you're in somewhere like Belmarsh? What, what's it like? Um, and and I was thinking of those sketches that you would see from, uh, you know, those places that we 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 knew Julian would go to, uh, ADX Florence and 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 uh, um, uh, also you know in in Colorado and it, it kind of just thinking of how the cell is like it's one it, everything is one giant blob you know even the bed is like kind of part of the floor it just rises up that was the same thing really in, in this cell I, i'm not saying that it's necessarily like a supermax but it just it reminded me of that concept of how um there's there's literally nothing it's just a toilet and you know with with the room uh yeah it, and it was quite weird being surveyed the whole time uh I, I don't know what the point of that was uh you know except to maybe like intimidate you or something and and I keep wondering to myself, like if I'm imagining this, but I could have, I could have sworn I read on the ceiling, it said something of forensic surveillance, and I and I kept wondering to myself, what the hell is forensic surveillance? Like, do they scan your heartbeat or something? Like, what what is that? Um, and and I was just thinking to this whole complex, this whole industry of, uh, you know, uh, cyber weapons and another weird crap that we have in England. Um, who knows how deep the rabbit hole goes? But it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me. Um, and and I know these things exist. It's not you know beyond the imagination. Uh, it's just it's so crazy that I, I have to wonder like <laughs> if I if I completely made it up, but I didn't. And and um, even just a, a regular camera and a microphone. I mean, I I, I thought to myself uh, honestly, um, you know, it's uh, it's it's just really weird and dehumanizing and 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 bizarre. And I didn't understand what the point of it was because you, you remember this is a jail cell, so it's not like you're you know, you're even convicted of anything. And even if you were, why, why would you treat someone like that? So that, that was 
that was what it was like. And, and I did think of Julian and I was wondering to myself, like, you know, Christ, is his cell like this? <laughs> what, what are the cells in Palestine like? Are they like this? Um, so, yeah, I, I just I was thinking all sorts of things. And, yeah, it, it did. It yeah. did certainly come across just, my mind. His background, Richie was stopped at Heathrow Airport. He was actually on the plane. I believe they came and got him and they questioned him under Section 12 of the Terrorism Act, UK Terrorism Act, and then threw him in a cell for almost 24 hours. And he mentioned the options here. I, I have no idea what's going to happen, but it seems like they just want to intimidate you and not really put you, charge you or put you in any kind of a trial. Because they, how could they convict you of terror of any terrorism uh, for your journalism? It's 50-50. 50-50. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think they, they really want to start the crusade against free speech. I, I don't think it was... Uh... Just yeah. to int intimidate. I really think it's uh, it, wow. because if, if they can, if they can, you know, set a precedent with me, they can go after a, a lot of other people. And and right now, um, you know, as as Julian said yesterday, it's it, there's more impunity than before, right? So, yes, I'm looking at that court right now. He said, "I see more impunity, more secrecy, more retaliation for truth telling, and more self censorship." That was not a very encouraging thing that he said there. Um, so, Richie, uh, of course, Craig, you spent time in prison as well. So um, we don't want to exclude that. You you had that at Harvard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, yeah, I spent four months in, in solitary confinement, in effect. Well, it, not in effect. I've spent four months in solitary confinement, full stop, um, in, in jail for 23 and a half hours a day, uh, in, in the cell for 23 and a half hours a day, in a cell which is 12 feet by eight, and that includes the toilet and, and, and wash basin. Um, it's not very pleasant. The um, and it, it's important to understand that um, what Richard is being investigated for, and I, I'm in the same situation. I'm under investigation for terrorism, right. and the investigation. People ask me, "Is the investigation over?" And you you never know. You know, they, and as with Richard Barnard, they might say it is, but the next day they might change their mind. But there isn't any legal process that conclusively closes an investigation. Uh, it, they, they can act on it at any time they wish, whether even whether or not they've said it's closed. So um, this can just be held over your head. And it's important to understand that the under the legislation which Richard Barnard is being charged with, Richard Barnard, and I'm I'm actually going back to the UK. I'm avoiding the UK by and large because of this. I'm living out of the UK, but I'm going back uh, tomorrow specifically to attend uh, Richard's um, plea uh, hearing where he has to plead guilty or not guilty, which is being held at the Old, ba Old Bailey on Friday morning. So I'm going back for that. And I'm, I don't know if I'm going to be arrested at the airport or at the Old Bailey or at, at any stage of that. Uh, and, you know, R Richard is being um, charged with making a speech at, the the offence in his case is making a speech, um, and uh, and the offence that um, Richard Methurst with us is being uh, is being investigated for. You were saying they you won't be charged. He could well be, and um, the the the, 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 the offence is expressing an opinion. That that's what the uh, that's what the act says. It is illegal to express an opinion uh, which supports a prescribed. Uh, organization and you don't have to you don't have to intend to support the prescribed organization so it may be you weren't actually supporting the prescribed organization you're just expressing an opinion and it could be taken for example a court could rule that for you to say that palestinians have in law the legal right to armed resistance is to express an opinion which supports hamas even though you didn't mention hamas uh, you merely mentioned that the state of international law. My understanding is that's what that's what they're investigating in my case. Whether my my expressions of support for the rights Palestinian right to armed resistance, even and it doesn't matter if it's inadvertent. If they if if the court thinks that encourages somebody else to support Hamas, because you said there is a right of armed resistance, then you and it's fourteen years in prison, maximum sentence, fourteen years in prison. Um, and of course, um, when when you have a crime which has a maximum tariff of fourteen years in prison, that although that's merely the maximum, and they don't have to give you that; they can give you a suspended sentence. They can probably give you a fine. I'm not sure. Um, but the, when when the maximum sentence is fourteen years, if you're found guilty of it, the judge tends to take that as an indicator that a serious 
So they might give you four years or five years or something. But if the maximum is 14, that they're unlikely to just give you a slap on the wrists because evidently the legislation indicates it's an extremely serious offence. And this is what um, Richard Barnard is facing. This is what Richard is being investigated for. It's what I'm being investigated for, expressing an opinion which uh, may, which can be interpreted uh, as leading somebody else to support a prescribed organisation, whether that was your intention or not in expressing that opinion. Uh, and it, it, you know, this legislation is so uh, draconian, it, it, it almost um, beggars belief. I'd like to say on the plus side, um, I think it's. It, I, I think Richard's trial will be a jury trial. Um, but, but there are trials held under the Terrorism Act which don't have juries, but I don't think this will be one. I think it will be a jury trial. We've seen. I, I, I need to confirm that when I'm when, when I'm in London. We've seen um, acquittals of Palestine action activists for um, going into Israeli-owned arms factories and smashing up equipment, uh, where they were definitely guilty. And the jury has refused to convict because the jury has been convinced by the defence argument that they did it to to prevent, you know genocidal actions against Palestinians, even though the judges have been stating to the jury they are not allowed to accept that defence. That's not an acceptable defence. The juries have been ignoring the judges and basically telling the judges to, to F off <laughs> and and acquitting. And um, so I think the, um, I think the, I think it, there, there's a lot of safety in the jury mechanism um, as a kind of last resort. Um, and in fact, to the extent that back while you and I, Joe, were at the, uh, and I think Richard as well, while well, we were all at the last uh, Assange hearing in the High Court, that very same day in the High Court, uh, the government was bringing a case related to Palestine action. Um, the government was bringing a case to the High Court, asking the High Court to rule that jury nullification should be made illegal, that the juries should not be allowed to find not guilty if the judge directs them to find guilty, which in effect is dispensing with the jury altogether. Unfortunately, the government lost that case in the High Court. The High Court refused to say that it, it will be a, it, that it's illegal for juries to go against the direction of the judge. So, so that was a, that, that, that's a small comfort in, in, in all of this. That was really important that they uh, lost that case. I was going to ask you about the jury notification. I think you recently posted something on Twitter about that. That's, of course, how a jury could say um, the law may say that this is illegal, but we don't agree with the law. Most famous right. case that led to the First Amendment in the U.S. is the uh, the case of the printer in, in the colony of New York. He wrote a very critical article of the British governor of the New York colony, uh, whose name was Bill Cosby, William Cosby. And they brought him to trial. And in those, in those days, it was a criminal offense uh, defamation. And it was a crime to say something against the uh, the representative of the Crown. And the jury said, no, well, we, we know that's the law, but we don't agree. You think he told the truth? And the truth is a defense in our view. The truth was not a defense by the law. And that led ultimately to the, that's the Peter Zenga case. That I'm talking about. So uh, before we go on, who was Richard Barnard? Uh, tell the audience who exactly he is, and what speech did he give? Richard is the um, is the co leader of Palestine Action. Um, he and and Huda are the two um, the the two leaders of that group, and that group takes direct action against Israeli arms facilities. It blockades. Um, Israeli defense uh, contractors in the United Kingdom, and it and it goes in and smashes them up if it can. <laughs> you know, they actually they they actually not they don't harm people, but they take action against uh, machinery uh, or transport, etc. That is part of the machinery of uh, the Israeli defense industry. Um, and the uh, the speech he gave. Um, I, I probably can't repeat what he said. I, probably if I repeat what he said, I will get the same charge. So oh, I can't. Uh, yeah. I can't tell you what he said. Uh, he said exactly, but it was. Um, uh, he was suggesting that the actions of seventh of October weren't uh, obviously in as far as they didn't uh, 
we, we now know much more about how so much of the killing on the 7th of October was done by the uh, by Israeli forces and, and how nearly all of the atrocity stories are completely untrue. We, we, we now know, know that much better than was, was known back at that time. But he was suggesting essentially that Palestinian military resistance, uh, as exemplified by the 7th of October, is not a bad thing and, and, and should be uh, and should be amplified. That was uh, that that was the, the the tone of his speech, and that that's what is, is leading to his prosecution. Well, this this is a good example of a chilling of speech. You're in France. You're not in Britain right now, physically. You're on an American network. We're protected by the First Amendment. We're the one broadcasting this, and you didn't want to repeat what he had to say. It's just unbelievable. But speaking of that in Palestine, let's move to the Middle East if we can. Gentlemen, I hope you could stay a little bit because uh, we reached a point that I think Netanyahu has lusted for for years to get the United States involved to attack Iran. And they've done everything they possibly can under this extreme right wing lunatic government in Israel that is seeing this opportunity. I think they have a short window they saw to complete the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, of greater Palestine, begun way back by Ben-Gurion in the Red House in Tel Aviv, where it was all planned and started to be executed in 1948. And it's been a slow motion, ethnic cleansing and genocide for all these years. And now they've sped it up. They've moved, moving into the West Bank and now in Lebanon as well. And there was a lot of pressure on Iran and Hezbollah in the region to respond. And I think they're not suicidal because they're not just worried about Israel. There's United States aircraft carrier and troops and they're pouring more there. The U.S. is directly militarily involved in this. It's not that without that backup, I don't know whether Israel would have uh, invaded or carried out these uh, Lebanon, carried out the assassinations. And now we've gotten the attack from from Iran on Israel. So, Richie, tell yes. us what your assessment is of where we are. Are we on the verge of a major all out general war in the Middle East? The last time on April 13th, when uh, the Iranians uh, struck uh, Israel. I, we didn't really see any response from or, or response to the response from the uh, Israelis. They kind of just stood down and uh, they, they, you know, they just continued what they were doing in in Gaza. So th there, there's a small, tiny chance. Now, again, this is assuming there there there's some rational people there um, that they will also just uh, stand down now and and kind of just you know. Uh, take the punch and 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 you know um, and not do anything. But given their actions recently, it doesn't look like they they want de-escalation. On, on the contrary, I mean, I think that they are seizing the opportunity. They they thought, okay, we got away with with killing um, uh, Haniye, and we got away with the pages, and we got away with uh, assassinating uh, Nasrallah. Uh, let's try and invade Lebanon. I think I think they they you know they want to start the ground invasion. They've kind of gone in a tiny bit, but there's been a, 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 a lot of uh, fighting now. So it, it's not like 1982 yet, but uh, they, they they're certainly trying. Um, it's if you recall at the beginning of of um, last October, they they were also kind of trying to prod Gaza's defenses, and then it took them a few weeks to actually get in. Uh, so that 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 might be a similar situation. But um, I I really don't know. Uh, it, it, you know they. The genocide is taking longer than they wanted. Um, they, their plan to kind of export and throw people out into the desert in Egypt, it hasn't worked. So there might be an incentive for them to to not go for all that war just so they can get that project finished. But again, I I I don't I don't think that um, I don't think they care. I think they'd rather deal with Iran primarily uh, and get the U.S. Um, you know doing what it's doing now, which is sending thousands of troops and, and, and aircraft carriers. It's looking very bad. It's, re it's really, really looking bad. And it's astonishing watching um, uh, Sky News or so and, and all these other channels talk about how, you know, it, it, it's always kind of the same thing, right? It's like, it, it, it's not an escalation when Israel is, is killing people and, and so on, but it is when, when the other side responds. And I don't know. I mean, it's... it's um, it's just not looking good. Uh, these are not rational people, and and they, you know, they're hell bent on destruction. I mean, if you look at the last week, we've had Israel bombing Yemen, we've had Israel bombing Syria, bombing Lebanon, bombing Palestine. Um, you know, 
now maybe they they might go for a run. I, I I don't know what they're planning next, but they're, they're not rational actors, and and it's very very dangerous. Netanyahu, if he wants an all out war, I don't think it's going to go in his favor. I think he's he's kind of deluded, you know, with power. He's drunk with power. So what do you think about the um the potential calculation that Israel may be making um in regards to the timing with the U.S. election? I mean, obviously Harris and Trump are both. Uh, rabid Zionists who are extremely supportive of Israel. They seem to fight more about, you know, who can support Israel the best. So I don't think that they're worried about support either way as far as the outcome of the election. But it does seem interesting to me that they're willing to go this far in the weeks leading up to a U.S. presidential election. Do you think that weighs in at all for them? Yeah, yeah absolutely. That, that That is a very important point to raise, because if you look at Trump, he he did a lot of things that U.S. presidents before him didn't do. Um you know, he moved the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. He he declared, uh, you know, <laughs> that that Jerusalem was Israel's capital. He declared that the Golan Heights are Israeli and not Syrian. And um, you know, he 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 broke with with a lot of um, not just U.S. positions, but you know, Security Council resolutions that have been passed um, four nine seven two four two that 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 really said Israel has to leave um, the uh, Jerusalem law. Uh, the Golan Heights law are illegal. They're null and void. Israel cannot annex these territories. So he, he he was not just breaking with previous positions. He was also just violating international law. And and this is very convenient, of course, for Biden because you know if anyone is if anyone were to get flack, it would actually be Trump and not him. Obviously, no one got any flack, but he gets to just inherit all these positions, these pro-Zionist positions, and keep them. Um, but you, you know it's 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 difficult weighing. Uh, if you will, which is worse? I mean, loss of life obviously is, is is going to be worse. But you know, is is Trump more Zionist? Is Biden or the or the uh, the Democrats are they more Zionist? I think if we're asking these questions, um, you know, it, it, we're not in a very good place. Uh, but uh, for for the Israelis, they're certainly calculating like there's an election in four weeks. Um, yeah, this is a good time to escalate because um, you know, if if it's an outgoing president, they're not going to get any of the flack because they're done. Um, uh, or an outgoing administration, uh, you know, and if it's an incoming president, well, you know, he's 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 pro Zionist enough either way to help us. So I, I do think they're counting on a Trump win, um, and you know, uh, I think uh, Trump will not hesitate to help them continue the genocide to bomb Iran, and he's even putting out all these things about Iran wanting to assassinate him, for example, you know, which is. I mean, I don't know where he gets this from. I, don't, I think it's concocted on purpose to kind of galvanize his base into thinking that, look, Iran is a threat, even if you don't care about Israel, but you all do. Uh, you care about me and, and they want to kill me. So let's go after them. You know, there's there's many um, angles and 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 uh, um, layers to this to this propaganda. And uh, it's a win win for the Israelis either way, either way. So it, we're not in a good place, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, globally speaking, we're we're really not, um, and and I and I'm and I'm quite ashamed that we're supporting all of this. Uh, you know, it's really, it, it's it's one thing for the leaders to do it, but you know, to do it in the name of the country, I, I think is is really disgusting. I, I mean, I can I can tell you in the UK at least, most people, uh, you know, what, whatever part of the majority you want to say, but it's still a majority. They don't they don't like Israel or what Israel is doing, and they want no part in it. Um, and, you know, Israel could not do these things without our support. So when you when you're asking me about the U.S. election, you're asking me because Israel without that U.S. support and, and, and Joe also hinted at this, you know, it can't it can't carry out genocide. It can't uh, annex uh, territories. It can't behave like this. So the element is crucial. And it is it is a very important question to think about, you know, um, which administration is going to benefit the Israelis more sadly. Uh, just like in the UK, whether you have Tories or Labour, you're, you're ending up with a Zionist government. I think we're being forced to make Israel's enemies our own. Iran is not my enemy. I think it's, as you just said, Richie, it's the majority of British people, Iran is not their enemy. But we have to agree that it is. And um, but let me ask you, Craig, are we going to be able to avoid an all-out general war, what I think Israel desperately wants? And, and Iran put up incredible patience here. I think they're not irrational. They're not suicidal. But how much more could they take? I think Iran has shown astonishing patience and, and, and forbearing. And I'm very pleased of it. And the same is also true, of course, of Hezbollah, perhaps even more true of Hezbollah. And of course, there's a game of chicken going on here because um, if Israel 
attempts to make proper large scale advances into in, into southern Lebanon, Israel is going to take an awful lot of casualties, and and it's um, it's confined itself to comparatively small raids. What they'd love to do is be able to provoke Hezbollah into trying to come into northern Israel, where they would take extremely large uh, casualties. So so that that's the game that's been going that's been going on, and obviously Israel has more capacity. Uh, for long range strike than, than Hezbollah has. Um, uh, it's just like this incredibly dangerous game of chicken. But it, the question about the election is interesting because you know, the calculation obviously is that if Iran does go that much further in attacking Israel, that the United States will join in war on Iran on the Israeli side. And the, the Israelis are making the calculation that. Um, as usual, but not not supporting Israel would be a terrific electoral liability. Uh, that that the uh, the candidate who did not fully support Israel in the war would lose the election for not fully supporting Israel in the war. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, undoubtedly all political wisdom is that that would be true in the past. Whether it's true today is a different question, because I think for the Democrats joining in a war on Israel's side may actually lose them a significant percentage of their vote and not gain not gain many new votes. Um, uh, of course, also not joining in an active war alongside Israel may have an impact on campaign fund contributions, but that um, uh, Perhaps it's getting late in the day for that, and that most of the money has already been already been raised. I'm not sure how much of the campaign money comes in during the last month, but those are interesting calculations that are being played out here. Um, it, it's true. The, apparently, the British were involved in helping shoot down Iranian missiles yesterday, though I, how involved and with what assets is not entirely. Clear. Uh, presumably, Aliyev Akutiri was being uh, uh, was being used again. But you know, there are interesting questions here. The, the 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 British have made an issue again, and it hasn't really it hasn't been the issue it should be. The parts that the fact that bits of the island of Cyprus are British sovereign territory, uh, which um, um, which really needs to cease. You know that that's a that's another um, colonial. Settler area in <laughs> very close to Israel, uh, hosting British colonial settlers on on a next land which still belongs to the British Empire. Uh, so um, uh, that's becoming an issue. But there's now real resistance in Cyprus to, to the existence of those bases, which has been very very low key in recent years. So um, uh, the ramifications of all of this are quite interesting. It's also a case, you know, if if, if you stuff the seas around the Middle East are full of aircraft carriers uh, with all these missiles flying. You know, aircraft carriers are, are very large targets uh, for missiles. And how sensible it is of the Americans um, to be putting aircraft carriers in in the way of what may become a hot war. And if this becomes a hot war, those aircraft carriers become targets. And at the moment, obviously, people are holding back from that kind of escalation. But I would be very surprised if if the USA does join in alongside Israel in a hot war of actually attacking Iran, if, if America doesn't lose some of its its major ships. Um, and that's a calculation of American policy. You, know, you don't look quite so clever if, you, if two of your aircraft carriers have just sunk. That, that's a calculation which um, which American politicians need to take on board as well. I see no sign they are taking those calculations on board, but uh, but they, they I'm sure the military will be, and the uh, and the politicians really ought to be. Well, I think uh, Pentagon, we may need them to save us again. Step in and say, look, there's a real risk. We'll lose an aircraft carrier. We'll lose ships in the Gulf. They'll close yeah. the Straits of Hormuz. We've been hearing about that for a long time. That Iran could choke off and the entire world economy by shutting down oil from Kuwait, from Iraq and from Iran, et cetera, uh, and Qatar's gas and all. So um, I want to ask Richie, well, how much punishment you think the Israelis are willing to accept? They have been, and we've seen through cast lead and all the other mowings of the lawn in Gaza, thousands of Palestinians, nothing on the scale we're seeing now, dying and six Israelis dying. And they call that a war. But so basically, and they're, 
like the New York Times wrote the other day, Tel Aviv is going on, you know, restaurants, one other. It's as if they're completely insulated from this incredible violence, not very far from them. And yet a, a missile or a couple of strikes hit Tel Aviv. They went after apparently Mossad headquarters. Uh, how much is Israel prepared, the population, to take? How much are the this Israeli government willing to inflict on their own population? Because Hezbollah has an incredible uh, arsenal of missiles, and so does Iran. That could hit Israel. Generally speaking, I I, I know that in the in the last uh, in the last uh, day, um, so uh, you know the last twenty four hours, they got hit. I think just Tel Aviv got hit by Lebanon, by Yemen. There was a shooting attack, uh, I think a lone wolf. Um, uh, and uh, you also had Iran uh, firing at them. And, and that was really kind of the first time in this um, in this war uh, or, or episode of the war that uh, you had an Israeli city uh, under, under so much fire. And again, it, it has been hit in the last couple of months on occasion by, for example, Yemen firing one thing uh, like a hypersonic missile. And then that's it. Um, uh, well, that's it. Uh, but to, to, to see so much, so much fire from so many directions and, and directed at, at, at Tel Aviv, it, it is, it is um, uh, quite unique and, and even more, it even surpassed what we saw on April 13th. So, you know, I think that was the first time in 76 years that the Israelis have ever experienced um, any, any form of bombardment. And, and even then it was, it was directed just at military targets from, from, you know, the reports that we're seeing in Israeli media from the videos that we've seen. And as far as I know, there, there, there have been zero casualties or at least zero civilian casualties. Uh, but, you know, if you look at earlier in the day yesterday when they targeted the Mossad headquarters in the suburbs of Tel Aviv, um, Gililot base, or, or, or also in, this, in, the, in the same area, you have the uh, military intelligence headquarters. So that's uh, Unit 8200. Those were hit with with uh, um, with uh, rockets. And the, the thing is that uh, you saw already on the highway, like this disruption to Israeli life. I think you, you even had some casualties. Um, uh, and if you look at the videos that were coming out in the evening when Iran was hitting them, you also saw people in the bunkers and, and in, the, in the air shelters and air raid shelters, which again is, is, a, is a luxury, I should add, that Palestinians don't have. Um, but, uh, my point here is just that Israelis, you know, one of the things that draws them to uh, to go and colonize and occupy Palestine is it's the amenities, you know. Oh, OK, we're at the beach. Uh, we're in a lovely climate. We've got all these nice things going for us, you know, uh, infrastructure. Uh, it's segregated. There's apartheid. You know, it's just uh, uh, for Jews and and. Um, you know, we have all these privileges of being bankrolled by the West and, and, and so on. And this kind of disruption to their daily life, to their daily routine, is not something that they're used to. Um, it's not something that they they are able to tolerate. Um, I know, I know, as you've been saying, they've been kind of just going about their, their their lives and so on. But if you look at Beirut, that that is really an example of people, you know. And I, it kind of breaks my heart in a way because they're so used to the bombing, to the Israeli bombing. They they just, you know, you'll see people just going about their lives like it's nothing. But of course, it, it does impact people and it impacts multiple generations. Um, but, you, you know, and there is no air, air raid shelter infrastructure like you see it on the Israeli side. But my point is just that people in Palestine, people in, 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 in Lebanon and Syria can, can take um, these kinds of, of punches, not because they should or because it's OK for them to do it, but because they just they don't have anywhere else to go. The Israelis have that escape route of just going back to their countries. And when they, you know, when they have that possibility of leaving, they're not going to stick around and be inconvenienced in this way. So, you know, while the political and military leadership may want to go ahead with a war, I don't think that uh, Israeli, you know, the general population will be able to um, accept and live th that way. I think many of them will leave and you have at least half a million that left in the first uh, two months of the war, according to Israeli media. I, I, I would... I would guess that figure is much higher now. Craig? Yeah, I'd, I'd actually like to ask Richard something on which he's particularly expert, and which is an aspect of this which I think is, is given far too little um, discussion. And that's, of course, the Sunni-Shia divide and the fact that by dragging in Iran and, and by attacking Hezbollah, 
um, Israel, in a sense, is attracting support from extreme Sunni sectarians, and particularly Salafists. And we've seen that from elements of the Free Syrian Army, for example, and we've seen that from elements in northern Lebanon, where, where that support for Israeli attacks on Hezbollah has been has been manifest. Uh, I think on this occasion, I think I'm right in saying that this time we didn't see Jordan joining in and shooting down the Iranian missiles, and that may be because the uh, uh, the population of uh, Essentially, my, my own analysis, ha having spent time in the Gulf states, uh, is is that the populations are much more anti-Israel and much more pro-Palestinian than their ruling classes. But the ruling classes are are also very anti-Shia, very very anti-Shia, and, and very influenced by by, by this, uh, particularly the Salafist school of of Sunni Islam. Um, and given the choice between attacking Iran and attacking Israel, uh, the ruling classes of the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia and possibly the King of Jordan, uh, given the free choice, would probably attack Iran every time and not attack Israel. And and um, so, and this is almost never commented on in the West. I, I, I've seen virtually nothing on it in the Western media. The, 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 in in spe specialist places like Middle East, you may get a little bit of analysis, but, but I, I see very little on it. And... Um, this is an area where Richard's extremely knowledgeable, and I, I, I'd be grateful for his thoughts at this moment. Yeah, no, it's, it's a very good question, and I've 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 kind of avoided um, uh, talking about it, not because uh, of, of of any particular fear, but I thought, um, you know, one because you you do see this in 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 some media circles, and and uh, uh, you know, they, there's kind of this um, they because they don't like Iran's political positions. Um, they they try and exploit this uh, Sunni Shia divide, if you want if you want to call it that, or inflame it rather. And so to to avoid helping that kind of narrative, I've just left it alone. But since you since you asked, I'll be happy to oblige. Um, yeah, th there is definitely a, a huge huge difference between the population and 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 the leadership. And I know that you could say that in you know almost any country. Uh, uh, you know you could say it's it's also true in 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 Western countries and so on. But on this issue in Arab countries. You can go from Amman to Morocco, and and in almost every single and I and I and I think in every single one of the Arab countries, the the without question, the overwhelming majority of the population will tell you they are with Palestine. No matter if they're Sunni, no matter if they're Shia, and you know when it comes to to Lebanon, it's a, a quite a a, a fractured um, uh, society. I mean, you you it, it, it's uh, kind of the opposite of Syria in that sense, where you do have all these religious and ethnic groups, but instead of the harmony, you've got the divide, right? They, they, so, you know, you, Christians in Syria will be more pro-Iran uh, or rather pro-resistance, whereas Christians in Lebanon, uh, a, a portion of them will certainly have that same position, but then you'll have people like phalangists uh, who actually collaborated with Israel. So it, it, it does depend. But um, in, the, in the Gulf Kingdoms, um, I mean, I I was also wondering yesterday, where, you know, where they all were. They they seem to be absent from the the orchestra and and, and the performance. Um, you know, uh, I should remind the viewers that most of these these kingdoms in in the Arab kingdoms, whether we're talking about Saudi Arabia or we're talking about Jordan, um, or we're talking about uh, you know the UAE, a, a lot of them were created by by Britain um, and then bankrolled by by the UK and the US. Um, you know, I mean, e even if you you go back to uh, you know, the First World War, um, you had a, 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 de a democratic, you know, kingdom formed in Syria, and then uh, France essentially removed Faisal, and then Britain tried to get him uh, to become king of Iraq. And just, you know, uh, the geographic makeup of the Middle East, it, it was not decided by Arabs, it was decided by the West for this specific reason, to have, you know, control over the region, and it was done based on sectarian lines. It was done specifically with this idea in mind that we want to pit Sunnis against Shias, we want to have a Jewish uh, uh, portion here called Israel, we want to put the Christians inside of Lebanon. And they even tried to go further than that and, and divide Syria into even more subgroups. So that hasn't changed. That that hasn't changed in, in terms of um, the West's thinking. And, and because a lot of these ruling families were put in power by the West, um, you know, they, they're afraid. They're afraid of losing power. Um, so on the one hand, it's natural that they will have a pro-Israel, pro-Western position because that's who is keeping them in power. That's who's giving them money. That's who's giving them security. But then when it comes to religion, 
I mean, they, they're more than happy to exploit that because you have, uh, you know, the Saudi royal family, which is, you know, uh, uh, inter intertwined with Wahhabism. They, you know, and you look at also when it comes to Qatar and you look at a lot of these uh, Arab kingdoms, they, they backed a lot of Salafist jihadist groups in Syria. So they do have ideological interests as well. It's not just about we care about the West or we care about who's giving us money and who put us in power. They do have their own ideological affinity. So when when you have Iran standing up, Iran is a Shia country standing up for Sunni Muslims in Palestine, it makes Saudi Arabia and it makes the its neighbors look impotent and 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 weak and as if they don't care about the Palestinian cause. I think a lot of Arabs are, are, are waking up to that reality and just seeing that, you know, um, they, Saudi Arabia is not going to champion Palestinian cause. It's not like, you know, the, when they had the oil embargo uh, 50 years ago, um, that Saudi Arabia is gone. And so, you know, it, it, it's uh, it's kind of funny because despite them being embarrassed by, by Iran, they're still not willing to do anything. Uh, if you look at Netanyahu going to the UN the other day, he held up a map, right? He held up the same one he brought last year. And you can see this economic corridor that's going from India through Saudi Arabia, uh, through Jordan, uh, sorry, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, um, and and then to Israel. So, you know, they they have their own projects. Um, they they they're not democratic countries. They don't care what their people think. And um, you know, uh, so I, I'm just trying to lay out all those those uh, kind of dimensions um, for for people to grasp why why it is that you have a situation where, you know, uh, th those leaders don't support the Palestinian cause. It's not in their interest economically politically or religiously um and they they do try to uh, uh attack iran a lot if you if you would watch the media in the last couple of months they were saying iran is not going to respond to hania's assassination uh iran betrayed uh nasrallah you had a lot of this talk and i think last night really uh, uh shut them down uh and shut them up quite a bit well I, to go to craig's question um jordan didn't take part apparently in this effort to stop the Iranian missiles this time. More than half the population, if I'm not mistaken, of Jordan are Palestinians. And yeah. uh, the ruling and the ruling family is more British than they are uh, Arab yes. in many ways. That's what I meant. <laughs> Sandhurst and all of that. And when you go to Amman, you see that that palace is very high up off the street. I remember looking. Up. So will the people be able to even rebel uh, in that country? Certainly, probably not in Saudi Arabia. Although there is the Shia eastern part of Saudi Arabia that may become rest, rest of, I mean, well, my question to you, Richie, is, is there any chance of disturbance if these governments, these awful Gulf governments, Gulf uh, monarchies, uh, stand by and let uh, Iran be decimated? And not, and they've been standing by letting the Palestinians be decimated. So how much more? Yeah, could Go ahead. it's a very good question. And if you recall during the Arab Spring about, you know, 10 years ago, a uh, little more than 10 years ago, um, in 2011, that you didn't have any of this uh, revolution in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, it, it, it bizarrely enough did not happen in those places. And, and I think that that gives you a little bit of an indicator um, that not all aspects of the Arab Spring were 100 percent grassroots. Not all of them. Some of them were definitely. Um, uh, but uh, there's a reason you didn't see one in, in Saudi Arabia. There's a reason you didn't see one in Jordan. Uh, and and uh, you know the UAE and, and and Qatar and that those countries had their interests protected. They were stable. Uh, and, you know uh, any tiny voices were completely shut down. So I, that doesn't give you a lot of hope for for um, uh, any sort of political change. I think what what is really going to cause their downfall is if um, you have uh, you know a a rapid transition into a multipolar world, and th that explains also why Saudi Arabia. Um, and, uh, you know, um, and Egypt also chose to go and join BRICS. It's not, it's not because they necessarily believe in that system hundred percent. They, they're just, you know, they're biding their time and they're, they're, they're choosing, they're basically saying, no matter what happens, we're, you know, if the West continues to prosper, we'll still be with the West. Um, and in the worst case, we'll, we'll be with BRICS. So, you know, they're, they're basically just putting a, uh, getting their foot through the door in case that happens. They're not 100% behind the project. And, you know, they're, they're just serving their own interest um, and trying to ensure the survival of their uh, regimes or their governments or their systems of power. So um, 
I, I don't I don't see much uh, uh, hope of a, a revolution or something like that or, or people in those countries having their voices yeah. heard. Uh, but, uh, you know, we should be criticizing them a lot more because, again, even if Jordan didn't participate last night without their support, um, you know, they, they, the Israelis, again, could not do what they're doing. And a lot of American bases, you'll find them in Qatar, you'll find them in Saudi Arabia. And Jordan even want to start hosting a NATO base uh, in the future, in the near future. So, um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's just the, these countries, they, they were not just created by the West, but they're still serving the West and they're not serving their own people. So no matter what way you look at it, from a decolonization perspective, from a democratic perspective, they have to go. You know, I want to, uh, Elizabeth has a question about how Russia might react to all this if Iran is attacked. But I want to bring up China because a little more than a year ago, there was an extraordinary breakthrough of Chinese diplomacy getting involved in the Middle East and actually brokering a rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which if you look at all the conflicts throughout the region, they're at the, the heart of this conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia, in Lebanon, in Bahrain, uh, in Syria, etc. What about China's role here? Let me ask Craig first and then you... Richie, can, uh, they've sort of disappeared right now. They played that very positive role, and we haven't heard from China recently. Yeah, and I think the uh, the accord between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which China brokered, which seemed at the time like a like a breakthrough, has kind of dissolved into mist uh, and, and been overtaken by events. Um, the Chinese have been making excellent statements at the UN Security Council, which have been really forthright. You know, but Chinese diplomacy tends not to be forthright. It tends to be rather cautious and and shadowed. Uh, and very often you read a Chinese statement and, and you're not quite sure which side of, of, the, of the issue they're on. But that's the not the word, wasn't it? Uh, the British diplomatic <laughs> use? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't wish. I, I, I'm, I was saying that and I, I, I was very well aware of... Um, of kind of projecting colonial stereotypes, uh, so I I was kind of wishing I wasn't saying it was well, true, but it it is true. Uh, Ch Chinese diplomacy is often very guarded, and uh, and they they very often don't wish to take sides on on issues where they don't see their own national interest as particularly affected. They haven't been like that at all. I've been really surprised by by how excellent and forthright China's positions at the UN Security Council on Palestine have been this last this last year. Um, but what they've not done is show any willingness to exercise any any muscle, uh, either diplomatic or, or military. Um, uh, I can't recall the figures anymore, but I saw the numbers of aircraft carriers and, and, um, and major battleships that China is producing uh, every month. Uh, and it was a breathtaking figure. But, the, but um, China shows no sign, thankfully, of, of interest in military power um, projection or in providing any kind of military counterbalance which might might deter the United States from being too rash. Um, and it hasn't it hasn't used its very substantial uh, economic um, muscle. I, I, I calculated a few years ago that um, that China with its dollar reserves, could actually buy every single company on the New York Stock Exchange three times over if it, if it wished to. <laughs> but, um, uh, China hasn't actually exercised that that kind of must. You know, with that kind of power, but there's an awful lot China could be doing if it wanted really to calm this down. Um, and we haven't yet seen. I was hoping this might be where we start to see. We haven't yet seen Chinese international assertiveness. Manage match its new economic dominance, um, uh, uh, and, and this is this is partly to do, I think, with uh, with Chinese philosophy, it, 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 in effect, with their philosophy of government and their philosophy of trade and how to make money and how to behave. But um, at some stage, you know, with, with what's happening in the Middle East and what's happening in Ukraine, between them, raising the risk of global annihilation until it's, it's an actual real threat rather than a, a you know a, a remote possibility, at some stage, the Chinese are going to have to get more involved and they're going to have at least behind the scenes to start putting pressure. But there's there's no sign of it yet. Let me ask uh, Elizabeth to, uh, to weigh in because she has to leave. Yeah, I, I just wanted very quickly to ask you, um, you know, if a hot war does start, especially if the U.S. joins Israel and openly warring with Iran, 
What does Russia do? I know that the Russian prime minister visited uh, in the last couple of days with Iran. Um, will Russia openly join that war? And, and what are your thoughts on that? Russia is extended at, at, at the moment. It is effectively fighting, gi given that modern warfare is less, of, less about infantry boots on the ground and much more about technology, uh, 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 particularly uh, missile technology, drone technology, aerial bombardment. Um, Russia is effectively fighting NATO. It, it's not really a proxy war that's happening in, 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 in Ukraine. Russia is effectively fighting the technological might of NATO. Um, it would be very difficult. Russia does have forces in region, of course, in, in, in the Middle East still, but it would be very difficult for Russia to take a serious part in um in in the military confrontation in in, in the Middle East at the moment. And I and I think it would be it would be very hard to argue that's in Russia's self-interest. So my my expectation is that we, we wouldn't see uh direct Russian involvement. We we we, we may see some actions taken to try to, to try to help Iran, but they but they they almost certainly wouldn't involve you know the Russian Air Force or anything along those lines. I I would be extraordinarily surprised if if, if that were to happen. All right, Rich, anything to add on that? It was certainly there'll be. I think there already are selling yeah. S four hundred anti aircraft to Iran, so there'll be arms sales from Russia to Iran at the least, right? Yeah, I I, I concur with Craig. I I think it would be very difficult for the Russians to um take on uh, both at the same time, but. Uh, we, we should also recall that it's actually Russia that's been buying a lot of weapons from Iran um, in in this uh, uh, you know in in the last few years um, just recently um, you know uh, but also in, in the beginning of the Ukraine war and they they were laughing they were making fun of uh, the Russians and saying oh look they're you know the sanctions are working we've cut off their ability to buy microchips. Uh, they have to get them from dishwashers now and microwaves. And, uh, you know, they're trying to smuggle them through Belarus and it's failing. And look how majestic the sanctions are. And, and they were now they have to buy their drones from Iran. And now they have to buy artillery shells from North Korea. Look at these two failed states supplying Russia. And ironically, it's these two exact things that turn the tide of the war in Ukraine. It's it's artillery shells, the 155 millimeters. You know, the Russians have been stockpiling these things for so long. It would it would take the United States and they have a factory in Pennsylvania where they've they've spent billions on upgrading it in in uh, in, in the last two years. It, it would take them, I think, 40 years uh, uh, to to get the amount that Russia already has now um, 20, 30, 40 years, something ridiculous, decades at the least. And, and even then they wouldn't catch up because Russia is buying them off and producing them in mass. And those things are in massive short supply. You can just do a Google search of 155 millimeter. You'll see the Israelis are in short supply. Ukrainians are in short supply. Everyone needs them. And the Russians and North Koreans have a lot of them. And then those um, drones, of course, that Iran supplied, uh, you know, they, they uh, one second they were saying they're a bunch of scrap. And then the next thing, they, uh, next second they were saying they're wreaking havoc on, on Ukrainian cities. Uh, so, so obviously they are lethal and, and, and they do matter. Uh, now that war is not over. Um, it's still ongoing and it's very, very bloody and and, and it's it's frankly quite um, uh, heartbreaking that you have hundreds of thousands of men, young men killed on both sides for what? L literally for what? Um, it's really heartbreaking. It's an entire generation gone. Uh, but uh, to go back to your, to your question about uh, Russia being able to support Iran, I, my point was with laying out uh, this relationship was just to say that they do have a vested interest uh, for their own security when it comes to fighting NATO and Ukraine uh, to, to make sure that Iran stays afloat. So, you know, that support doesn't necessarily have to include um, uh, the Air Force, the Russian Air Force or boots on the ground. It could include intelligence. Um, they might give them, uh, as you uh, suggested, Joey, uh, S-400 systems or maybe um, even uh, give them the, you know, radar uh, electronic warfare uh, systems, which, which have been very, very important as well in Ukraine and the Russians have, have the best systems in the world uh, uh, in that regard. So th there's a, th there are lots of ways they can support them. Um, and I think you would absolutely see that if, if you're not already seeing that right now. Um, I, I, I think the Russians would rather that there's no war at all, but if it really comes down to it and it hits the fan, um, I think they, they will take a much clearer position than the Chinese and they will uh, support Iran. Well, we began this conversation talking about Julian Assange. And I want to end with that. It seems like everything we're talking about right now, we need this guy. 
we need this guy to go back to journalism. Uh, and most journalists are people are strange, obsessive creatures who can't take a holiday without uh, going back to work because things happen all the time. Uh, they never stop happening. And uh, if if he's the journalist, I believe he is, and, and uh, he seems clearly to be, he's going to want to get back in the game. What do you think, Craig, from what you uh, you see? I'm quite sure Julian wants to get um, uh, to get back, but he he you know he made plain he wants to prepare, he wants to study, he, he wants to be fully up to date with everything uh, before he he get seriously gets gets back to it, and and I think that's good anyway. But but my, my own views, I I was in solitary confinement for four months. J Julian's had you know sixty times I think the uh, uh, the, the problems that I had, but. Um, I found when I came out from solitary confinement, um, sensory overload was a big problem. The, the, just the the amount of information your brain is taking in when it's when it's been starved of any information to take in it whatsoever, except blank walls for you know twenty four hours a day, um, uh, it, it, it causes a, a genuine dissonance in the mind, uh, and it takes. I say it took me some time to get over that, and it will take Julian much longer because he, he he's had this. This terrible experience for for so my my own thought is I, I've got no doubt I'm, I I don't doubt Julian will recover um, I thought what I saw very much encouraged me that, he, that he's very much on the road to recovery um, but I I hope that he doesn't basically I don't want to see him again before Christmas I want him to go back with his family spend months more. Away from people, even away from his own his own rather large entourage, uh, uh, and studying and uh, researching uh, and living a quiet life with his kids until the new year. Then I think in the new year he will come out fighting. But but, but 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 that's what I hope we see. Richie, I'm just happy he's free. I'm I'm really happy he's free, and um, you know. It took a miracle, but but it 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 certainly worked out in the end. Um, and you know, um, I I just hope that, uh, and 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 I'm sure he will. But I I certainly hope uh, deep down he'll he'll go back to doing what he's he's always done. I think it's in his nature. I think you 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 alluded to that, uh, uh, both of you. And um, yeah, it's just it was good to see him speak. You know, and I I totally understand. And as a matter of fact, I encourage and I and I fully support the the idea of of take you know taking a secluded approach uh just you know slowly kind of getting back into the world and and i can only imagine the sensory overload as well uh i mean we we've got it we, you know just just being out here never mind if you're 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 inside for for years and then you come out so um there there is a lot to take in and um i'm, I'm excited to to see what wikileaks will will uh, will do next um there's a lot to be done with uh meshing you know technology and, and journalism, and that plus the Snowden revelations is, is, is inspired me to do some, to kind of dive into this stuff and um, uh, do a lot of work in terms of, you know, uh, just kind of making sure that we can do our jobs as journalists, but also doing it in a, in a safe way. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have more to talk about that later, but it's just good seeing him out. It's really good. And fortunately for Julian, it's summertime at Christmas in Australia. So he's going back <laughs> at the right time. And I want to thank both of you guys. We really appreciate the wide ranging discussion we had. And we hope to have you back again soon. So for CN Live, this is Joel Laura saying goodbye.